Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Hello everyone. I'm glad to uh, start this very informative, very uh, rich uh, presentation about very important uh, findings that has been published worldwide uh, a few weeks ago. And we are honored to have Dr. Modi as the moderator and Dr. Michael as the main presenter. And I just want to spend about one minute just before before we all enjoy the, this scientific uh, presentation to say uh, hello to everyone and to reintroduce the Heritage Commission, one of 11 cultural uh, commissions uh, uh, founded almost two years ago. It was February 2020 by the Saudi government under the umbrella of Ministry of Culture. And we are responsible of managing, protecting, uh, activating the cultural uh, heritage in Saudi Arabia and on the top of this, of course, archaeology and all the related issues. And I found this timing to uh, reaffirm, uh, reassure uh, our, our approach of dealing with international and local expertise, either universities, research centers, uh, companies, individuals. We are open for any cooperation that will help our mandate. We have huge mandates. Uh, uh, at least now we registered uh, 8,000 archaeological sites, but we know there are many thousand and thousand uh, uh, sites that un untapped and discovered, and we are starting huge work in, in very, very uh, well-known areas that has been uh, under development. One of them is al -Faw, as we all know, the famous, uh, famous location in the southwest of Saudi Arabia. We enjoyed all the, the inscription of of uh, Hima cultural, uh, cultural area as the sixth uh, World Heritage Site. And we are, we started already a project of rock arts documentation. We started and almost starting actually the, the project of stone structures project. It's a huge one that will, will last for at least three, four years. And on the top of this, we have this amazing project, Green Arabia, which, which, is, which, has, uh, uh, which has changed actually some of the theories that is in about about humanity and the early migration uh, from uh, from human beings to from Africa to to the north of uh, Arabia at that time Saudi Arabia currently I'm sure we will enjoy the talk but I I like to extend my invitation to you to to attend future uh, scientific sessions and we have in two weeks actually uh, the first online archaeological session in two days and we will announce it in our social media accounts and um, we all honor, honor in, the, in, the, in the Heritage Commission to have you all online. And we are organizing many face-to-face -face events uh, in the next year and it will be announced. Thank you very much. And I will hand it now to you, Dr. Modi. Thank you very much. You, you, need, to, you need to attend the mute, okay. Of course, I muted myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jasser. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce tonight's session, which is the third uh, in a series of lectures conducted, presented, and hosted by the Saudi Heritage Commission. As Dr. Jasser mentioned, these meetings are part of a series hosted by the Commission to showcase some of the recent groundbreaking research on archaeology and history in the kingdom to open up this fascinating work to a wider audience and to encourage discussion around new research topics and collaboration within and outside of the kingdom. The previous sessions for those interested are available to watch on the Ministry of Culture's YouTube channel. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing Professor Dr. Michael Petraglia take us through recent discoveries on climate change and human settlements and migrations in the Arabian Peninsula. Evidence recovered from various sites in the kingdom show that there were repeated phases of increased rainfall that transformed the landscape into a green Arabia. The fieldwork and interdisciplinary research undertaken by tonight's speaker and his team in close collaboration with colleagues in Saudi Arabia and the Heritage Commission sheds new light on climate and behavior in early human history. Dr. Petraglia has a PhD in anthropology from the University of New Mexico, where he also completed an MA in anthropology. I personally got to meet him and work with him uh, during his years as co-director of the Center of Asian Archaeology, Art and Culture at the University of Oxford. 
Prior to that, he was at the University of Cambridge and the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. He currently serves as Professor of Human Evolution and Prehistory at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, where he has played an integral role in building the Institute's new globally prestigious Department of Archaeology. Over the course of his career, he has developed and led major collaborative fieldwork projects in various countries, notably for today's lecture, The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He has written and edited nine books and published over 250 peer-reviewed journal articles. It is an understatement to say we are lucky to benefit tonight from Dr. Petraglia's expertise. Before I pass him the mic, I will remind everyone that at the end of his lecture, we will be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, Dr. Petraglia, we welcome you and the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Moody. That was wonderful. And of course, it's great to see you again. And hopefully we see you again in Saudi Arabia working with us side by side. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I thank the Heritage Commission for the invitation and particularly Dr. Jassir for all of his encouragement uh, over the last year or two. Um, I, I, I really uh, love working in Saudi Arabia, so I hope that really comes across in this lecture. Um, but tonight I'm going to give you an overview about uh, our research uh, in Saudi Arabia that's been taking place over a period of about 20 years. Uh, so uh, we'll be looking at climate change through time, and we'll be looking at how uh, humans and early humans reacted to those significant climatic changes uh, over 1 million years in Saudi Arabia. This story is still unfolding. There is still a lot of work yet to do, but I hope to give you some highlights of what we've learned, uh, particularly in our intensive field work that we've been doing in Saudi Arabia for the last 10 years. Um, and I believe, and I hope you will find that this work is really relevant uh, to modern questions today about uh, questions about climate change and how humans humans are adapting to these changes. Uh, and I hope that you'll find it's extremely relevant to Saudi Arabia itself in terms of its history and prehistory. Um, but also, I, I hope you'll also see that how important this work is for world heritage as well. Uh, and, and I hope that you'll see that uh, Arabia plays an absolutely fundamental and key role in our knowledge about uh, uh, human uh, evolution and our development through time. Just in terms of a little history here, um, I, I actually started to work in Saudi Arabia from 2001. And that was uh, owing to a visit to the National Museum of Natural History by Saudi archaeologists back in, in, in around 2000. And I was delighted to meet the Saudi archaeologists uh, because at the time I was working in India and I was very interested in human migrations out of Africa and across Asia. And when I met the Saudis at the time, uh, they said to me, well, why don't you come to Saudi Arabia? Because we think, uh, you know, it's a, Saudi Arabia is a stepping stone in terms of migrations, both outside of Africa and perhaps also from Asia into Africa. And, and from that very invitation, I, I, I took an opportunity to come to Saudi Arabia through the U.S. Fulbright program. Um, and I spent several months in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, with my hosts at the National Museum. And this was a delightful time period because uh, my colleagues in the National Museum um, helped me with literature searches, uh, all this literature that I, I was not even aware of that was uh, in places like the Fine Journal at Law. Um, which was, the, so there were many publications that were, were sort of not available to me um, before I had visited uh, Saudi Arabia. And I was so amazed to see all this incredible surveys and some excavations going on in Saudi Arabia for decades, in fact. And so based on that two-month uh, visit to Saudi Arabia, 
I then immediately wrote some publications and you just see some examples here um, back in 2003 when I, I wrote some overviews about the Paleolithic history of Saudi Arabia. And that then spurred on additional work. I, I started to um, a network with Saudis and other Western scientists on looking at Arabia as a key place. Uh, and so in 2009, we edited a, a major volume uh, published by Springer Press on the evolution of human populations in, in Arabia more broadly. And we took a very interdisciplinary approach. This was not just uh, archaeology. Archaeology, of course, was uh, uh, a very important component to our edited book, but we also marshaled the views of other scientists like uh, paleontologists, uh, uh, geologists, geneticists, and we all came together to put a story about human evolution in, in Arabia uh, back in 2009. So all of my work up until that time was really based on literature review. I had gone to some archaeological sites uh, that thanks to the Saudis, they brought me to some archaeological sites, but I had actually not done any field work in Saudi Arabia for about a decade. Uh, but I was writing many articles and trying to put Arabia in the context of world prehistory. And so in going out to some of the sites that I, I was treated to, to go and see, I was really stunned not only by the literature, but by the landscapes and the archaeological sites in, in Saudi Arabia. And then from there, um, um, I, I got to know a lot more people. And over the last 20 years, I, I'm happy to really say that we've had a lot of support um, from the Saudi uh, government and from Saudi scholars. Uh, and it has been absolutely delightful to work in Saudi Arabia. And you can see we had conferences back in Oxford where I used to work. Uh, and it was attended by uh, dignitaries and a lot of important people. We've also had lots of field visits and visits to important players in Saudi Arabia. Um, and sort of wind up to today, uh, uh, you know, this lecture is part of a 20 year legacy in a sense of having worked in, in Saudi Arabia. And so I'm really delighted to be giving this, uh, this talk sponsored by the Heritage Commission. And I, I thank Dr. Dosser for the invitation and I very much look forward to many productive years of, of working with the Heritage Commission. And having worked in Saudi Arabia now for the last 20 years, I also want to say that we, the, everything I'm going to be talking about is underpinned by collaboration, partnerships with Saudis themselves, but also by many Western scholars. There have literally been hundreds of people from all places of the world that have worked on the projects that I will be describing tonight. Um, and I consider them not only colleagues and partners, but actually genuinely friends. Uh, this has been a, a long-term project, which has really relied on the expertise of many people. And so while I'll be giving you an overview, I want to really emphasize to you that what lies behind it is a lot of hard work by a lot of people, of course, Saudis, but also our international partners. Now, um, as I said, you know, my original first years, uh, my first 10 years, in fact, of visits to Saudi Arabia were all just sort of uh, looking at literature, getting to know people, looking at some of the sites in the field. But it was really in 2010 when our field work really launched. And uh, this is a project which we call the Paleo Deserts Project. And it was funded by the European Research uh, Council in a very big way. Uh, it, it, it was five years of, of, of a lot of good funding, which allowed us to hire a lot of excellent people on the project. And this, this project, the Paleo Deserts Project, has a website, as you see, which needs updating, but it's been out there for a while. 
and, and it and it shows you all of our publications and the kinds of activities we have had going on since 2010. And more generally, this project has become known as the Green Arabia Project, as Dr. Josser said. I mean, this is a, a term, uh, the Green Arabia Project, which was which has really been taken on by not only scholars, but the public at large. I get emails all the time from people around the world that want to know about the, the Green Arabia Project. And so this has really hit a chord with people uh, uh, about Saudi's uh, prehistory. And it's not only hit a chord with the public at large, but also with the media. We have literally had dozens and dozens of articles written about the Green Arabia Project by the media. And that has been something that's been delightful because here's an opportunity to show the heritage of Saudi Arabia, but also to hit the public and to tell the public something about all our very technical work and translating it to, to, to them in order to educate people about the importance of the heritage of Saudi Arabia, but also its role in global history. And I'm really quite proud to say that, you know, this project has been recognized by, by the Saudis themselves, by the Saudi government, but also it's an award-winning project, as you see here. And I'm just so happy to have been um, recognized, our project being recognized by, by the, the Saudi government and by the Antiquities Department. Now, our project is very special in many ways, and that is because when I originally put in a proposal to the scientific committee, I didn't ask for one spot in Saudi Arabia. Many projects center on one spot uh, for long periods of time, for decades, in fact. But our project was quite different because I actually asked the scientific commission for permission to go to many places across Arabia. And that was very unusual. Um, and the scientific commission rightly so asked me, well, why do you want to work in so many places and moving all around the landscape? And the answer to that for me was very simple because in order to learn something about you know, Saudi history and prehistory, we wanted to see how it looked like on the ground and in many different places. And that is not one place, one place does not tell the whole story about Saudi history. And in fact, in putting in that proposal 10 years ago, we have been to at least seven or eight different places around Saudi Arabia. And I can tell you that each place tells a slightly different history. But in doing so, in looking at all these places together, they tell a stronger story about Saudi's history. And I'm going to show you that. Um, and going to these seven or eight different places uh, has been remarkable. We have made one discovery after another over the last 10 years. And we've worked from northern Saudi Arabia to southern Saudi Arabia and from east to west. And I'm going to give you the highlights in this lecture over the last one million years, what we've learned over the last one million years, including all the way up into the last 10,000 years. So this is an incredible history. Uh, and the story, like I said, is still being told. Now, one thing I really want to get across to you is not only have we looked widely geographically, but we've also applied a scientific approach right from the get-go. I talked about an interdisciplinary approach, and the Green Arabia Project relies on this kind of approach. It's not just purely archaeological. Archaeology underpins the project, but we are incorporating the work of many scientists. We have many global partners, many global labs, many global scholars involved in the Green Arabia project. So Saudis are fundamental, of course, to executing and doing this project, but we need the best science in the world. And that's exactly what we're doing. And so you can see, I won't 
belabor all of these different approaches, but all of these approaches and many more have been used in the Green Arabia project. Um, we here at the Max Planck uh, in Jena, Germany, also have some terrific labs. And so we are undertaking a lot of scientific work here. And many of the projects do center on Saudi Arabia. So we need the sediment samples. We need the faunal samples, for example, uh, from Saudi Arabia to, in order to conduct this very advanced uh, laboratory research, utilizing some of the most advanced technology in order to tell a story about our past. And one of the major discoveries and something that I'm really quite um, happy about to this day, and in fact, a bit shocked about, is that one of the things that we have done right from the beginning, uh, thanks to our geographers that have that have worked on this project, is that we applied satellite technology to this project from the beginning, 10 years ago. And we've been working on this satellite imagery for the last 10 years. And one of the most remarkable things that have come out of this project is that Arabia was covered by a network of rivers in the past. So these satellite images show us that entire river network. And the river network was vast and flowing many times in the past. And not only was there a river network that flowed many times in the past, we can also see there were many lakes and wetlands. And our geographers, our remote sensing specialists, have actually counted up to 10,000 ancient lakes in Arabia. And that number is remarkable because it shows how wet Saudi Arabia and the rest of Arabia was over time. And we have visited about two or 300 of those 10,000 lakes and on 70% of those ancient lakes, we have found archaeology or fossils. And if you were to project that by the 10,000 lakes, that would mean there are literally tens of thousands of undiscovered archaeological sites in Saudi Arabia waiting for discovery. And so, like I said, this story is just unfolding. This is just the beginning of the archaeology of Arabia. The other thing besides satellite imagery we have done is we have incorporated and used the, the great research of cli climate modelers. And so we have looked over time, through time, at how Saudi Arabia and Arabia may have been covered by rainfall. So rainfall has really varied through time. And so on the right, uh, you will see an image that looked of the climate model. This is us looking at the green Sahara or green Arabia back 125,000 years ago. So this is a computer generated model of what climate would have looked like 125,000 years ago. And if you look at the green, you will see there was plentiful rainfall across Saudi Arabia. And so Based on this satellite imagery, based on these climate models, we can hypothesize that Arabia was wet or green many times in the past. But it takes the archaeology, it takes the fieldwork to go out there and verify these models. And that is exactly what we've done over the last 10 years. And I'm going to roll through some of the highlights now, starting with the earliest periods of time and what we have learned. And this is unpublished research. I'll start with some unpublished research, a field project that we executed about two years ago, and we're working on this. The science takes a long time, and a lot of the lab work has taken a long time, and of course the pandemic has been thrown in there. But I'm delighted to say to you, uh, on this unpublished research, 
we now have from the caves, from the caves of northern Saudi Arabia, records that now exceed one million years ago about the environmental history of northern Saudi Arabia. This is brand new information, not available to anyone. So the caves of Saudi Arabia is giving us the environmental context for human occupation of Arabia. These are not living sites. Humans were not living in these caves, as far as we are aware. But these, what are called speleothems, the records that we're drilling into in these caves is giving us a climatic record exceeding a million years. And we think we could go even deeper in time. So, you know, we're worried so much about climate change today, of course, and in the future, well, we are going to be able to put that in context by looking at a million year record in Arabia. And so we look forward to this publication. We, we, we are working with the climate scientists right now on this, and this will be a brand new story about Arabia. Another unpublished story about Arabia that we have been working on for years now. I'm delighted to say that um, the Saudi Antiquities Department helped us to bring to the table uh, the Saudi Aramco. And Saudi Aramco helped us to drill, to drill a core into the Juba Oasis. And this is very hard work that's obviously beyond our abilities. And we're just so happy that Saudi Aramco came to the table and helped us to drill into what we think are lake beds of the Juba Oasis. And these drill cores came back to Germany and they have been analyzed for at least three years now by a whole team of scientists. And I'm happy to tell you this is unpublished work and it will be published soon, uh, hopefully, inshallah. Uh, but this record also exceeds 1 million years. And so together with the caves, we are going to have fantastic terrestrial information from the lakes to tell us about the environmental history of Saudi Arabia. No one has ever been able to publish this record from the caves or the lake beds of Saudi Arabia. So expect brand new information about the environmental history to emerge in the next few years uh, for Saudi. Now, looking at some of the paleontological and archeological sites of Arabia and some of the highlights. This also is unpublished work. Um, so it's something that we need to put out. It's something that we still need to do field work on, quite honestly, but we think we have some of the oldest lake beds of Saudi Arabia. And this is what we call the Iron Lake of Tisagata in the Nafud Desert. And there are fossils on this ancient, ancient lake, which we call the Iron Lake because of its color. You can see the arrow pointing to it in the heart of the Nafud. And we've put some trenches in there and we have what are called paleomagnetic dates that we think are indicating a, a record exceeding a million years ago. So this is brand new. Again, nobody has ever published such information. So this is brand new. Uh, I can tell you more about it, of course, uh, but this site, we need to go out there and do a little bit more work on. And I hope that we'll be able to do that within the six, the next six or eight months. Now, what we uh, have published at Tisalgada is the upper lake, and we've worked side by side in some seasons with the Saudi Geological Survey uh, in order to execute this work. And originally, we thought this was just a paleontological site. But as you'll see in a few moments, this is an archaeological site as well. And it may be the oldest known oldest documented, currently documented archeological site of Arabia. And here you can see we've done some very careful controlled excavations at Tisagata, uh, along with the SGS. 
And the finds at this site have been remarkable. We've been publishing them since 2016. We still have to publish some uh, amazing fossils of this particular site in the Nafud Desert. But as you've, many of you have, may have seen uh, in, the, in the media and in publications, we documented the first elephants for Arabia. So here we have in the heart of Arabia, an ancient genus called Paleoloxodon, which is extinct. And we have their skeletons and we have their tusks. And these are gigantic creatures, gigantic. They weigh 11 to 15 tons as adults. And there were whole herds of these elephants migrating into Saudi Arabia. They were at least four meters tall. They're extinct now, but, but th this is telling you something about what kind of environments were present uh, 500,000 years ago in Arabia. And through our very careful recordation of the fossils and very careful study, we even not only have elephants, but we've got ducks and fish on these lake beds. And so this is telling you that this, these are permanent lakes, freshwater lakes in the heart of Arabia. So the fauna is very important in giving us a signal about what those environments were like. So we have fresh water. And of course, animals like oryx and gazelle and elephants live in savanna and grassland environments. So unlike the current Nafud Desert today. And following those oryx and gazelles were, of course, carnivores like wolves and jaguars that were hunting the oryx and gazelle. And so the carnivores were following these animals into the Nafud 500,000 years ago. But who else was following these animals? Well, it was early humans themselves. And so at Tisalgada, we have stone tools, buried stone tools that we can date and that we can see cut marks on the bones themselves, which is telling us that these early humans are following the animals and they, they are accessing the carcasses for meat. So they are subsisting for their dietary needs on the meat of these animals. And so we have the cut marks and the stone tools to prove it. So let me emphasize though to the Heritage Commission and the Ministry of Culture, this site is one of the kings of Saudi prehistory. It is so important to Saudi prehistory and we have hardly touched this site this site goes on for more than one kilometer. We've excavated 0.001% of the site, and we have actually looked under the dunes using ground penetrating radar, and we see these fossils go for one kilometer under the dunes. So that means this site goes on for at least two kilometers, and it is full of archeology, span and fossils. And these fossils are like museum pieces. They are gold in a sense, in terms of reconstructing what Saudi Arabia was like 500,000 years ago. And so I would just like to say, this is one of the most important sites of Arabia and it deserves our full attention. Okay, moving on up in time, 300,000 years ago, just a few months ago, we published one of the oldest, what are called hand axe sites of Arabia. This is called the Acheulean technology. These are handheld hand axe sites, like the, the, some of the tools that are depicted on the ground, on the upper right, and being held by a person. These are tools used to butcher animals. And this is a very distinctive technology found in Saudi Arabia, but also in other parts of the world. And you can see on our dots in the map, this is found in the Nafu Desert. 
and on a beautiful site we call An Nasim. And we have dated this, these hand axes at this site to 300,000 years ago. So younger than Tisalgada, but very important. This was, up until very recently, the oldest Acheulean site in all of Arabia. So a very important site as well. We also published a, a few years back now, another very important site at Dawadmi. We worked in Dawadmi for many months. And you can see at Safaka here at Dawadmi is right in the middle. It's in central Saudi Arabia, in the heart of uh, Arabia. And so here we have dated a site to 225,000 years ago. And it's the same kind of site like An Nasim. It's these hand axe sites uh, or what we call the Acheulean culture. And you can see that these early humans were getting into the heart of Arabia. How were they getting there? Well, they seem to be following rivers, right? So the rivers that we have mapped, we can actually trace them from Africa or from the Levant into the heart of Arabia. Now they were utilizing rivers to get to Safaka, but also most importantly, they were following what we call dolerite dikes. You can see here on the picture, uh, these two gentlemen, uh, of, uh, one of whom is Abdallah al sharaf from King Saud University, um, and uh, one of our guests from the Leakey Foundation, and they're on top of one of these dolerite dikes. And what's so amazing about these dolerite dikes is that you see these early humans are using this technology, that these dolerite dikes, to make their stone tools. And I'll show you examples of that in a, in a minute. But these dolerite dikes are a very important story because you can see that these dikes, and many Saudis may also know this, that the dolerite dikes go for hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers. And guess what? We have surveyed some of these dolerite dikes, and we can tell you that there is a distribution of these very ancient sites, literally for hundreds of kilometers. And so, this is the, the longest landscape in the world of Acheulean sites. This is one of the best known landscapes in the world for following the, how our ancestors moved. There's nowhere else in the world like this. This is unique about Dawadmi. And Dawadmi, I know, either has a museum or is hoping for a museum. Well, this is important to world heritage. And so here you can see we tested this site uh, at Safaka and we published this site a few years back. And we can see how the early humans actually, actually flaked these big boulders in order to make these hand axes, these Acheulean hand axes. And here we have moments in time from these early humans making stone tools 225,000 years ago. So we not only have the way they moved along the landscape, but we have a story of exactly how they fashioned and potentially used their stone tools. So we're learning so much about ancient behavior in Saudi Arabia, but also about the behavior of our ancestors uh, generally in terms of world prehistory. Moving on up in time. Well, here's another spectacular site that we discovered with our teams uh, a couple of years back and published um, by uh, Matthew Stewart and our team. Um, and I know um, uh, uh, Dr. Jasser also uh, helped us in getting the word out, uh, putting out a, a press release and a conference about this particular site not so long ago, about a year or so ago. And we dated this lake, it's a very tiny lake. It's one of our smaller lakes. Some of our lakes go on for 20 kilometers. This lake is very small um, and it's eroding out as you see. 
uh, amidst, amidst these beautiful and spectacular sand dunes. Well, we dated this lake bed to 125,000 years ago. Now, why is this Alatar so important? And you could probably get the, the hint in the Arabic word itself in terms of traces. Um, and here you go. Why is this site so important? Well, this is the first site we have ever found footprints in Arabia. Um, and we were so delighted to find this because you have moments in time again about the way in which animals are moving across the landscape 125,000 years ago. And here we have the elephants moving along the landscape, the ones we find the bones of at places like Tisagata. But we also have wild camel and we have all sorts of other creatures. We have up to 300 footprints of mammals. But not only that, we also have the very first human footprints of Arabia. We have seven footprints at al of some hunter-gatherers living here 125,000 years ago. And they're probably drinking uh, and hunting along this lake bed. Uh, and again, talk about a moment in time. We can actually look and measure these footprints. And in our article that we wrote, we argue that these are the footprints of us, our species, Homo sapiens. So this is one of the oldest sites of Sa in Saudi Arabia for us, our species, moving across Arabia. And so this is very important to what we know about us. And I will show you, there's more information about us because at Augusta, we've got another lake, which we dated to 85,000 years ago, and a beautiful, another beautiful site amidst the spectacular sand dunes of the Nafud. Uh, so we dated this lake bed and what did we find? Not, not the footprints this time, but we found the first human fossil of Arabia. And so this is a middle finger bone. And we've done all sorts of work on this finger bone. And we make a long story short, we were able to prove that it was a finger bone of us, our species, Homo sapiens, living there on a lake 85,000 years ago. Now, what's so interesting also about this fossil, not only being a first of its kind, but also it was side by side with other fauna, like hippos. Amazingly, we have hippos on Augusta and other sites. Can you imagine hippos living in Saudi Arabia? And we now have hippo bones on multiple sites. So again, it's telling you something about the environments in which modern humans were living in the heart of Arabia, because hippos need deep, permanent, freshwater resources, and so do humans. And so this is telling us how the environment story is coming together with the human story. And importantly for archeologists out there, we find what we call Middle Paleolithic technologies, not Acheulean, but this time Middle Paleolithic, side by side with this human finger bone. And we know these later humans are manufacturing these types of technologies, very different technologies than we saw for the earlier sites. So there's a big change in technology. And that's very important for us archaeologists to know something about. Now, uh, I bring you up to only six weeks ago. And this site uh, and this publication was of great importance to us because we uh, put together a story by Hugh Grucut and team, um, as you see here in this publication in Nature. And this site, in the Nafud, Kal Amashan, and in the Juba Oasis, we put together a story here about some of our best dated sites and the best sites where we have environmental information. 
We have beautiful Paleolithic artifacts buried in the Nafud uh, and in places like the Juba Oasis. And we've dated them very precisely. And this site is very important because we have multiple lakes in one spa. I, I, in describing this to the media, I often sort of describe this as a, a stack of pancakes that has fallen over. And so if you look closely at this picture, you will not just see one picture, uh, one picture of one lake, but if you can sort of see there's different elevations and there's a series of lakes here. So there's multiple lakes at this one particular spot in the Nafud. And that ended up being a very important story because each lake bed has a different date to it. So this stack of pancakes has fallen over and we can date each one of those pancakes, if you will, each one of those lakes. And in doing so, we can tell an environmental story through the last 400,000 years. So no spot in Arabia gives you such precise information than what we've got in this Nature article just six weeks ago. One thing I just want to mention about this article that I failed to uh, say just earlier is that even though this pub publication only came out six weeks ago, it's downloaded or accessed 26,000 times by people out there. 26,000 times, that's very unusual for a scholarly article. And so very important, it shows you the importance of this kind of publication. And when we put this out, working together with the Heritage Commission, 207 different media organizations covered this story. So we had a lot of media attention. And I'm coming towards the, so the, the close, I'm coming to the last 15 minutes of this talk, but I just wanna tell you here why this particular site was so important. So here we have these different lakes dating to the last 400,000 years. And you can see we have dates of 400,000, 300,000, 200,000 and so on at this particular set of sites. And not only do we have a series of lakes and different environmental histories, but look at the technology. The technology, the stone tools change through time. And so this gives us a whole history of cultural change through time. It tells us a lot in terms of the archaeological story of Saudi Arabia. And what does it also potentially imply? It implies this. It implies that we have the migration of different species of humans, our closely related ancestors migrating across Arabia from Africa to the Levant and using Arabia as the springboard for the occupation of the rest of the old world. And so we are arguing in our article and many other here and many other articles that Arabia is the crossroads for uh, different humans, different forms of humans, not only Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals, but this is also a story about us, Homo sapiens. And it's the, the origins of Homo sapiens in Arabia and their worldwide migrations. And, and the big story that I think this is really telling us after 10 years of hard work in Arabia is that Arabia can no longer be ignored. It is the cornerstone of understanding our history from Africa and all across Arabia. It is the most important route for migrations. It is the most important place for understanding our development and our evolution. And that story has hardly been told so far. Okay, so I've given you the, some really the old stuff. In the last 10 
or 15 minutes. I want to tell you about the last 10,000 years. And I just want to remind you, as Dr. Jossier and Dr. Moody have said, please ask questions. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for me to chat with you at the end of this lecture. I don't want it to be all about me. Uh, you know, this is where we are stimulated by dialogue and from questions and comments. But I want to tell us a story now about what we've been doing over the last 10 years on the last 10,000 years. And as we all know, the story about the cultural history of Arabia and Saudi Arabia is absolutely magnificent. And we see it in the traveling exhibits of the roads of Arabia and the wonderful book that came out and the exhibits in the National Museum. And I think the, the story of Saudi Arabia, it really is remarkable. It's beautiful, all the wonderful work that you all have been doing on the oases and in the deserts of, of Arabia has been extraordinary. And so, I, you know, on that research, that great research that's been done, we've also executed new field work. And I wanted to tell a story, not only about the deep past in the last million years, but I also want to tell a story about today and about the last 10,000 years and how the culture history has unfolded more recently and how, how we are living in places like Arabia today and what we might be facing in the future. And so I want to tell a story about Green Arabia again in the last 10,000 years, but also how important the fluctuations between Green Arabia and dry Arabia, if you will, have been important even in the last 10,000 years and how it stimulated cultural change through time. And one story I want to tell you is about the ecological story. So this is um, a publication that we've just put out and there are more publications to emerge. Again, back to the caves. We only have one season in the cave and we, to, we had here uh, in one of the, the caves uh, at Jirsan, in, in the Kaibar, a striped hyena den. Well, striped hyenas are very important because it can tell us so much about the ecological history. And we have dated some of these bones to the last 10,000 years, and we can see some of the fauna that was living on the landscape. And I don't have time to go all over this, but maybe some questions you can ask me about this but we're reconstructing what the environments were like at a cave like this. And we are doing uh, some ancient DNA work, so genetics on some of these bones, and this is unpublished work, but I can tell you the DNA retrieval from these bones, including human bones, has been successful. And it's all unpublished, and that's a new story that will emerge. But back to this fluctuation in environments, uh, in the last five minutes or so, I just want to tell you that what we've been exploring are the droughts, the dry periods in the last 10,000 years. And I can tell you that these droughts through time have had a big impact on Arabian societies. There's no doubt that these droughts have had an impact on the cultures, but also on the, on the health of people in the past. And physical anthropologists have actually shown that on some ancient cemeteries in Arabia and have shown the poor health of some people. They look very stressed and they look like they, they have problems with their diets. And so some of the droughts in the past may have really stressed these populations. And that's something we're really interested in learning more about. But also some of these droughts, we can even see it in the rock art, believe it or not. And I don't know if you can see, but if you can squint your eyes, you can see a cow here, a wild, uh, well, maybe a domesticated cow on this rock art. And one of our articles, we argued that this was a starving cow. You could see the rib bones, it's very skinny. It's behind the camels, if you could see it. And we argued that some of the populations, even in the Juba Oasis, may have been very stressed by drought. And we're also finding this potentially environmentally as well. 
So droughts in the past may have played a very active role in shaping some of these societies and cultures in Arabia. But we also want to know that people have also come up with ingenious solutions because some of these lakes were still operational even during droughts. We have very good environmental information at Juba to show this. And we have just recently published an article which actually shows you that uh, people were present in Arabia when we thought they were no longer present. And there are arguments by others that say Arabia was abandoned during this period of time. The interior was abandoned. But yet, at a place like Juba, we have just shown and proven it was not abandoned. And people were living in wetlands and lakes in the deep interior during this period, which we refer to as the dark millennium. So this is very important. And the other story that I, that, and thanks to such, such of the ama amazing work by the Saudis themselves, but also by the international teams, is really showing the ingenious solutions people over the last 10,000 years have come up with to deal with droughts and to deal with arid periods. And that is the construction of wells and dams and canals in order to survive through some periods where there was less rainfall. And so we see big transformations in Saudi culture and society through time because I think of changes in rainfall through time. So there were episodes of Green Arabia, but there were also episodes of drought. And I think to really understand this last 10,000 years, we need to understand the archeology, span but also something about the environments. And again, that is an untold story. So if we wanna understand our current situation and all about climate change now and in the future, the archaeology is a really grand experiment because we can really show that people lived through some of the challenges they were faced with in the past. And they innovated and changed their societies all for the better in some ways. So this is an important story. And some of these environments may have also led to major transformations in these societies. And thanks to some of the wonderful international projects that have been going on in Saudi Arabia, we're learning a lot more about the stone structures in recent years and new fieldwork happening on them. We did a little bit of fieldwork on Mustatil. Mustatil we just published about a year ago, again by Hugh Grucut and team. And this is an amazing phenomenon. I know a lot of Saudis will know a lot about this. And we've mapped some of these Mustatils and we've mapped them at places like Juba. And these are in fact remarkable. And we found cattle bone in some of the, one of these mustatils and this amazing uh, painted geomet geometric pattern on the platform of one of these mustatils. And to us, we argue in our article that these were ritualized monumental landscapes. And they were new ways in which people were adapting, perhaps, to increasing populations, but territoriality, and increasing aridity in the past as well. So it may have, all of this may have been working together to transform Saudi societies. And we dated one of these mustatils to 7,000 years ago in, in the Nafud. And so this is a very early date. At the time when we published it, it was the oldest dated mustatil in Saudi Arabia, probably no longer, because I think many people are now dating them. Um, but anyway, so these are, this is a whole untold story and we're mapping these sites and we wanna do new field work. Uh, last two slides, bear with me here. Um, one project that we've just proposed to the Heritage Commission is to work in the Juba Oasis in January. And this is just to give you a sense of some of our future project on the Holocene, the last 10,000 years. 
we want to go back to the Jubo Oasis because we know a lot about the Jubo Oasis. We've been working there for 10 years, documenting the archaeology, the environments, and the rock art, and the stone structures. And so we know a lot about them. But believe it or not, we've never worked in detail on the stone structures themselves. We have information from the cairns, but we even have mustatils at Juba. And so we want to go back to some of these sites and put the mustatils and these stone structures into environmental context, into the context of rock art, into the context of what people are doing on these landscapes. And that'll be the first time where we can integrate the stone structures with the environments in such an intimate way. And so that's our goal in January. This is all developing work, but this is the kind of work we want to develop in the next couple of years for the last 10, you know, understanding the last 10,000 years. And finally, I come to my last slide, but the other great wish, the other great hope that I have for our work in Arabia is to learn about the deep time back to that again, because I told you a story about the last 500,000 years in terms of the archaeology at sites like Tisalgado and uh, at Kalamarshan being very old, 500,000 years old, 400,000 years old. But guess what? In Saudi Arabia, I think we are missing a record that should be there for the last one and a half million years. So in other words, we know the archeological record of Africa extends before three million years ago. We also know the archaeological record of China extends back to 2 million years ago. But the archaeological record of Arabia only extends to 400 to 500,000 years ago. We are missing one and a half million years. I think I actually know where it is. So future projects, if we can mount them together with the Heritage Commission, I think we will make a major impact on understanding the role of Arabia in these migrations around the world for our really early ancestors. And I leave you with that. I hope there's lots of comments and questions. I thank the, the uh, Ministry of Culture, the Heritage Commission, which is the backbone of all of our work. I thank all of our Saudi friends and colleagues. I thank the organizations in Saudi Arabia that have been helping us for many years now. Uh, and I thank our international partners for exquisite, beautiful scientific work. And I hope you will allow us to come back, work with you side by side. And I hope we can work over the next 10 years to improve uh, the story about uh, about Arabia and global prehistory and history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Petraglia. I think I uh, per perhaps will take the liberty of speaking for everyone when I say I wish that could have gone on a little bit longer. That was so, so interesting and even at times mind blowing. I also think that inshallah, the next time I go home, and I look out onto the deserts outside of Riyadh, I will see it in with very different eyes. I will see some of those ancient lakes and even some of the animals you mentioned, like the enormous now extinct elephants, um, even the hippos and some of the other you know, predators that you mentioned. I mean, what an interesting, what a fascinating um, amount of evidence you've uncovered for the much, much earlier history of Saudi Arabia, much a different landscape completely to the one that many of us uh, tuning in will know and have grown up with. Um, we already have a few questions that have come in. I don't know if they've come in through YouTube, but I'm getting them. Uh, I'm being fed them. So um, I will, um, I will, however, start, if I may, with my own question before we turn to those and give uh, people a chance to keep asking. Um, my question is one that um, hopefully will pro 
may be more interesting to those who aren't, aren't archaeologists in the audience, um, who are just interested lay people uh, that want to learn more about Saudi Arabia's history and archaeology more generally. Outside of the kind of satellite images that you use, how do you decide where to dig? Is there any archaeology on the surface? Is there some other way that you make that kind of decision? Yes, Dr. Moody, thank you for asking. That's a very important aspect to our work. So a lot of our work is desktop, right? So uh, we have teams actually almost working full time on computers. Uh, you know, documenting what we think of the ancient lakes, documenting what we think of the ancient rivers, documenting the stone structures of Arabia. So that's what desktop work. And also, of course, documenting what we think were the environments of Arabia. Now that's all desktop work. And that's very important work uh, and work we've been having going on for the last 10 years. But what's so important is to do the field work. You know, we, we can just sit there and work on computers for the next 10 years easily and keep documenting, but we must go out into the field. And we must go out into the field to do two things. We must verify that our maps are accurate. So that is something very important. Originally, our maps were not as accurate as they are today because we would go out there and say we thought something was a lake. But we go out there and sometimes we would verify, indeed, it was a lake. But sometimes we were wrong. And sometimes there was a false positive, if you will. So it was just geology that we mistook for a lake. And so going out there to verify what we're seeing behind the computer is extremely important. So it gives us accuracy. And so we've gotten the accuracy of our maps, our satellite imagery, up to more than 90% accurate today. So I can tell you, because we verified the accuracy of the computer images, nine times out of 10 that we go out, we find what we're looking for. 10% times we're wrong, but that's okay. Maybe we'll improve our accuracy through time. But nine times out of 10, we're, we're good. And that's pretty good. So we're happy with that. Now, importantly, when we go out, we do pick certain places where we think we have really well, well, well preserved lakes, or well preserved rivers, or good targets uh, from the mapping. So we go out there and actually do survey. So we get in our Jeeps, uh, or we get in a helicopter that we sometimes have on loan from the Saudi Geological Survey. And we get in our Jeep, so we get in the helicopter, and we go and find those, site, those, those targets from the computers, right? And we go out there and do a survey. And guess what the survey shows us? Nine times out of 10, we're right. It's a lake. But amazingly, 70% of the time, we have fossils or some form of archaeology on the surface. Okay, but that's not good enough. Uh, so we have surface sites, but we've, what we've got to do is we've got to dig. We've got to prove that the archaeology is buried and it's buried in association with the lake, for example. And we do that. We put in trenches, we excavate. Uh, and then we date the lakes, for example. We have to date so we can prove we have well-preserved archaeological sites. We've got environmental information. And then we can reconstruct a story. And by going to many places, we are reconstructing many stories. And then we put the whole story together. So that's how we do our work. Thank you. Fascinating. And I would say nine times out of 10 is pretty excellent track record. Um, I want to remind the audience very quickly to please uh, ask your questions in the chat, in the YouTube chat. Um, any questions, we'd, we'd be very happy to, to take and answer them. Uh, and in the meantime, we have a few more questions that have already come in. Um, the first is that, uh, sorry, I'm just trying, going, going to find it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
Are the ancient migrations in the Arabian Peninsula evidence of the mixing of races or anything along those lines? Yes, yes, they are in short. So our species, Homo sapiens, has a start in Africa 300,000 years ago, right? But we do not know uh, the exact date of our migration out of Africa. There are some sites in the Levant uh, that date our species back to 200,000 years ago. Um, and so that's the oldest known migration out of Africa 200,000 years ago. And there's some fossils in the Levant to prove that of our species, Homo sapiens, to 200,000 years ago. But the oldest fossil we have of Homo sapiens in Saudi Arabia so far is only 85,000 years old. Nevertheless, we think our species may have been in Saudi Arabia 125,000 years ago. So the timing of that might be different in different parts of the world. But as I was saying in my lecture, some of these hand axe sites, the Acheulean sites, are a sign of more archaic species that we know are present in Asia and Africa. We have fossils of them, and they are species called Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis, for example. And they are the ones making these hand axe forms. So we are arguing on that basis of our articles that some of these hand axe sites, like Anasim in the Nafud, might be made by our earlier ancestors that are migrating across Saudi Arabia. But we've got to find their fossils to really absolutely prove it. And so I would say to you, the search is still on. <laughs> so uh, as I was saying, we've only been to a couple hundred of these lakes. That means we still need to go to about 9,000 more of them. So there's plenty of work and plenty of future discoveries yet to be made. Sounds like it. Um, fascinating uh, reply to that. Um, there's another question that takes us a little bit more toward geology, um, which is, are there archaeological indications um, in the volcanic areas, if any? Uh, well, so let, there's two parts to that. In a sense, the volcanic areas extend all the way over to Central Arabia, right? So it's part of these dikes. So these dikes that you see in places like Dawadmi are volcanic deposits, okay? So that's from really ancient volcanism, ancient volcanoes. Now, if you're asking about the spine uh, along the Red Sea, that's all these ancient volcanoes, I would say to you, we know very little about the early prehistory of that region. But we know some of those volcanoes were going off in the last 10,000 years, but we also know some of those volcanoes were going on millions of years ago. So they've been dated by geologists. And I find that particularly fascinating because geologists have been dating those volcanoes, but archaeologists have not been following that up. So part of my dream of working with the Heritage Commission is to figure this out more, integrating <clears throat> the volcanoes more with the archaeology. Very interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you also for breaking that down into the two parts. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, the next question is more um, about sort of sharing this information uh, a bit more widely. So the question is, how can we let the world know this information rather than publishing it in international scientific magazines? Is it by conducting an international conference in any place in Europe, for example? What, what are your thoughts on how best to, to share this information? Well, I would say I'm a, I'm a great, just personally, I'm a great believer in sharing the information. You know, for too long, we as scientists, ha I mean, we, we have to do the scientific work, right? And we have to do, we have to write our publications. And this is very difficult work. It sometimes takes years to put together an article. 
Um, and so this is laborious work. But I think it's also uh, incumbent on us, it's very important to get the word out because this heritage is, 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 is not only Saudi heritage, but it's also world heritage. And so the people of Saudi Arabia and the world should learn about this. And I think Saudi archeologists and, and Saudi government has been doing a fantastic job actually in getting the word out because you know, traveling exhibits like, you know, the roads of Arabia have been getting the word out. Um, we see the National Museum, the National Museum of, in Riyadh is fantastic. And all the museum building is fantastic. I mean, I think this is the way to get the word out more and more. But in, we've taken baby steps ourselves uh, and we've worked with places like the Heritage Commission in the past that all of our important articles uh, are, are disseminated to the media. And so if you actually look up, you know, some of our, our, our articles, you will see it in the media. You will see it in the, uh, you know, the Arab media, the Middle Eastern media, you will see it in the world media, BBC and CNN and the places like that. So we want to get the word out from all this technical uh, work that we are doing. And I know there must, there are plans afoot to put, disseminate this kind of information to school children and to teachers. This is really important. This is the next step. Uh, and, and I do get contacted sometimes by people like teachers and wanna know more. And I, I try to put them in touch with the Heritage Commission. Um, but, you know, it's true, you know, we, you know, uh, it's, it's happening, but we can do more and more to help the Ministry of Culture get, get the word out even more. I couldn't agree more, uh, especially on the, on the front of open access and on uh, educating children as well and sharing all this knowledge with them from an early age, which dovetails so well with everything that the Heritage Commission um, is doing. Um, excellent, excellent question so far. Uh, please continue to ask questions um, in the chat. I'm also checking my Twitter if anybody wants to tweet at me any additional questions if you're having trouble um, uh, commenting at all. We have a few more uh, already that have come through. Um, if you could please tell us, Dr. Michael, are there any efforts that led to discover any ancient life in the old city of Riyadh? Of Riyadh, anything, anything found there? This, um, it, I mean, I'm sure that the Heritage Commission can answer this better than I can in terms of the, you know, the current heritage of, of Riyadh uh, in terms of historic structures and things like that. But what I can tell you is that um, many surveys were done, uh, certainly in the 1970s and 1980s, <clears throat> before the extraordinary development that we see in places like Riyadh. And some of those surveys have come up with archaeological sites, and some of them very ancient within the boundaries of the current city and the spreading city that we all know uh, well, and including on, you know, in, on the grounds of the international airport and such. So we know the heritage of, of Saudi Arabia uh, extends everywhere <laughs> across Saudi Arabia. And of course, um, the Heritage Commission, you know, is working hard to protect that, their heritage, to understand it, before you know, development takes place. And this is why surveys are so important. It underpins uh, you know, our knowledge about the past, but also it is a way to manage and protect archeological sites before development. So this is extremely important uh, in terms of understanding our heritage, but also protecting it for the future. Thank you so much. Um, there's, um, a, I have a few more questions um, that have come through, and one of them takes us back to the footprints site, actually from a colleague of mine, um, is asking, uh, that, so there was footprints you mentioned of a wild camel. Is there any other evidence that kind of fits with that that has been found uh, in the region for the wild camel specifically? Yes, absolutely. We, um, we have the bones of wild cattle in some of our sites. And so, of course, Arabia, you know, we think of stereotypically the camel as the, one of the most important things. 
And it was true that the camel is extremely important to understanding, you know, the caravan routes and all of that, but that is very young history in a sense over the last few thousand years. But we actually have the bones of ancient cattle, wild, undomesticated cattle on a number of sites. So one of my dreams also is to understand, you know, the, the changeover between having wild cattle and then the domestication process, how people actually learn to manage wild cattle and turn them into such an important do domesticated species, which then transformed Arabian societies and transformed world history in terms of caravan routes and the Silk Roads and things like that. So I do think that with more work, we can actually understand the transition from, from wild to domesticated. And we haven't done that yet. Um, there, there is some information along those lines, but there's, there's a lot more to learn on that transition too. And I just want to touch on the wonderful work of one of our, our uh, rock art specialists, Maria Guagnet, who's working in places like uh, the Juba Oasis. And she thinks she has the transition from wild to domesticated in the rock art. And we have published that. And we want to do more work on the on Juba Oasis because if she's right, we should have the bones from the wild to the domesticated in Juba. That's incredible that we might be able to trace that sort of step by step, and and that's just incredible work that that she's been doing. Um, we'll definitely be looking that that paper up. Um, there's um, another question. We talked a bit about migration in the talk, uh, sort of through the Arabian Peninsula. But this question is, are there any evidence of migration inside Arabia from south to east or from west to east? I would just simply say yes. <laughs> so, um, yes, absolutely. It's not, I may have um, overemphasized Arabia as the cornerstone to world migration. And that is absolutely true. And I wanted to harp on that story because I think it's a big story. Um, but I should say, if we're looking at Arabia more locally or regionally, absolutely. Uh, we have the evidence within Arabia of people moving around. And don't forget, especially for the early periods, we're dealing with hunters and gatherers. This is before domestication and settlement on oases came into being. Once we have settlement and oases, okay, people are more permanent along them. And they're using the caravan routes as trade and exchange. But before that time, everyone was living a hunting and gathering lifestyle. And so people were naturally moving along rivers and they were moving along lakes. And that's why I think we literally have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of archaeological sites in Saudi Arabia because people were just naturally moving along the landscape. Thank you. Um, and another question about migration, this takes us a bit more to the global picture. Um, do you believe that ancient humans entered Arabia through the north, the route north of the Red Sea or across the Bab and Mandab or both? I, I okay. Um, if you would ask me which route, I would say the most important route to me, and this is a debate out there, but I think we have the evidence for it now, is the Sinai. I think the Sinai is a critical place that's been underplayed in terms of migrations. And that's because we don't know a lot about the Sinai. It's been part of geopolitical problems and there's not been a lot of research there. Um, and we need to do more research as archeologists in general, but our, our maps, we have mapped Africa, the Sinai, the Levant, and Arabia, and we think, we have argued in our articles, 
people and animals just walked. They literally walked along green, green Sahara and green Arabia into and across this region. It's very easy. You could just walk up, walk along and move into Arabia and move back into Africa. And this is the way hunter gatherers were moving. This is the way in which people with domesticates were moving. So, so I think that is the main route and that's the way elephants and hippos were moving. Okay. So just to touch on the Bab al Mandab that, you know, where the horn of Africa is and where Yemen is, that has been the favored theory in the literature for decades. But I actually think it's the least likely route for migration. And that's because you have to move across open water. It was never a land bridge. The Sinai was the land bridge. And so understanding Northern Saudi Arabia is the key. Understanding the, the food, but also the Northwestern part of Saudi Arabia, which is underexplored is the key to all migrations. So I think that that is the main route. And we have actually put out, I'm happy to share that information. We've actually put maps out there and we call it the Tabuk corridor. Because Tabuk, like it is today, is a green landscape. Rivers and lakes galore, many of them. So Tabuk was an important place in all the areas around Tabuk. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, you know, as, as uh, our very distant ancestors followed uh, the waters to get from point A to point B, we have to follow the evidence. Uh, and if the evidence points to, to one route, then that um, makes sense to, to go with that. Um, another sort of related question. Uh, studies, which may be the last one, I think, because we, we only have a few minutes left, and I think we've probably grilled you enough uh, for one evening. Uh, studies repeatedly confirm that man spread through the Arabian Peninsula coming from Africa, um, considering uh, the peninsula as if it were merely a bridge. Was there anyone in the Arabian Peninsula already, or is there another way to understand that? Um, well, two-part answer to that. One is that um, I've emphasized Africa, and so do the large majority of scholars, because Africa is our, our origin point for our species and for many other species. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean other species like the Neanderthals didn't, didn't speciate or didn't begin have their origins in Asia. They, we think they did. So it's possible there are Asian origins of some species. But our species go, goes back to Africa, and then there were migrations outside of Africa, okay? So I think there maybe are both things going on in Arabia. Arabia was serving as a bridge during certain times, but some species that may have their origin in Asia, Arabia could be playing a fundamental role in that. But it's an untold story. And again, this, the second part of this uh, question that I don't want to overemphasize is let Arabia as merely a bridge. I think the bridge is very, very important to us because it's a new story. Um, but like I said, there's probably hundreds of thousands of archaeological sites in Arabia, hundreds of thousands, the large majority of which we know nothing about. And so that means there is a story about local development, local change, regional change of peoples and cultures in Arabia. So there's an in Arabia story to be told yet as well. Fascinating, thank you. And I think that's the sort of perfect note to end on really, because it's a springboard for hopefully more projects, more collaboration and more lectures just like this one. 
Um, there were a few questions we didn't get to. Um, we'll, I'll hopefully be able to address those in some other way. Um, but thank you to everyone for the excellent questions, for the interesting, for generating such interesting discussion. Uh, thank you so much to the Heritage Commission for hosting this. And thank you most of all to Dr. Petraglia for a truly illuminating uh, talk. Um, we, I hope that we can reconnect at some point and learn more about your future research and what you've managed to put together in the last few years as well. So thank you so much and uh, good night and good evening to everybody uh, who's attended. Thank you, Dr. Moody and the Heritage Commission. Thank you.